Trick-taking games have been around a long time, dating back in fact to the invention of the modern playing card. The oldest trick-taking game we know of, Carnoffel, was being played in northern Bavaria in 1426, so that gives you about 600 years of trick-taking history to draw on. Now, I've done the research, and by done the research, I mean I went to the Wikipedia page and counted all the entries, so I can tell you there are around 100 documented, and probably a lot more undocumented, traditional trick-taking games that you can play with with a standard deck of 52 playing cards. So the question is, which of these traditional trick-taking style games should you try if you're looking to get into them? <laughs> trick question, you should get the crew. Or the fox in the forest, depending on how many people you're currently allowed to meet. But Andrew, I hear you ask, what exactly is a trick-taking game? Well, fortunately, trick-taking games are very simple, as explained by my old friend, Wikipedia. A trick-taking game is a card or tile-based game in which play of a hand centers on a series of finite rounds or units of play okay. called tricks, which are then each evaluated to determine a winner or taker of that States trick. The object of the rotation is typically clockwise, i.e. play proceeds to the left, and say an opportunity to black and the same to be the card because the play proceeds to the right and the same to the left, and the winner to the trick And they all lived happily ever after. The end. So trick taking is one of those things that seems more complicated than it is and it seems that way because it's frankly difficult to explain but also because of the jargon. Now trick taking games talk about leading the trick and following the trick and they talk about trump suits but in practice trick taking games really are pretty simple. So here's how they actually work. In a basic trick taking game each player is dealt a hand of cards. Somebody starts by leading the first trick, playing a card face up. Each other player in turn then follows the trick by playing a card of the same suit, if they're able, and more on that in just a bit. The player with the highest card wins the trick and leads the next trick in exactly the same way and you do this over and over and over until everybody's played all their cards and somebody wins the game by virtue of having won the most tricks. But if it turns out you can't follow the lead trick, as in you don't have a card of the same suit, then you can actually play any card you like. But in trick taking, the lead suit always wins. So if a player leads a trick with a two of spades, and I play a king of hearts because I don't have a spade, I'll still lose to the two of spades despite playing a higher number. Now there is one exception to the rule which happens if your trick-taking game has a trump suit and trump suits are determined by flipping over the top card of the deck or they're specified in the rules of the game or even just by a player deciding which suit is the trump suit ahead of time. And with a trump suit the aforementioned rules still hold but the trump suit trumps all of the suits so to speak. So now if the trump suit is hearts, my king of hearts in the last example actually wins over the two of spades. And those really are the basics of trick taking. Now of course each trick taking game has its own take on the concept and understandably so, yeah, you don't get 100 versions of the same game unless you're playing Monopoly. But in general, traditional trick taking card games adhere to two general rules. So the first is that trick taking games are generally competitive, though some of them might say teams of players and others might pit one player against the others. There's usually a competitive element of some sort. The second general rule is that traditional trick-taking games need three or more players to function as a game. Two-player examples do exist, but they're usually modern iterations of older games or they're not strictly trick-taking games at all. And even if they are, it's difficult to find one that's exclusively for two players. So it turns out there's a reason why trick-taking games tend to follow these rules and it's because these rules are hard-baked into the very concept of trick-taking such that removing them removes the very essence of the genre itself. So it's interesting that the crew and the fox in the forest not only break the rules but break them without losing that internal trick-taking structure. In 1999, NASA lost communication with its Mars Climate Orbiter as it went into orbit around its target, Mars, and never heard from it again. The orbiter, not Mars.
The NASA boffins worked out that the probe had approached the planet at the wrong trajectory, approaching at an angle much lower than it should have. The orbiter was either destroyed somewhere in the Martian atmosphere, or it pinged off and flew off towards the Sun, where, for all anybody knows, it's still orbiting to this day. So how did it happen? Well, a report into the incident found that a single piece of software developed by Lockheed Martin made its calculations using a US unit of measurement that is itself based on British Imperial units. In other words, they didn't use SI units, the standard measurements used in science and engineering. Which is bad enough. Even worse is the fact that NASA failed to notice the problem. Or rather, two separate NASA navigators did notice the problem, but their concerns were dismissed on the basis that they didn't correctly fill out whatever NASA concern forms you have to fill out when you have a concern at NASA. So why do I mention this in a board game video? Well, it actually ties in nicely to The Crew, a cooperative trick-taking game in which trying to communicate with other people is less like engineers and scientists using differing units, and more like those engineers and scientists using units they've personally just invented. So in the crew, you and your friends are astronauts and you're being sent to the edge of the solar system to investigate a mysterious ninth planet. It's probably not Pluto, although given the potential for things to go wrong in this game, it might actually just be Pluto. So if I get so much as one, actually Pluto is not a planet comment, I'm gonna... Regardless, none of this story is really that important in terms of playing the game, uh, because the framework in which you play is just basic trick-taking, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you think about it. Um, what does a story about going into space have to do with trick-taking card games? And more to the point, what does it even mean to play a fully cooperative space-based trick-taking card game in the first place? That's foreshadowing, FYI. The crew comes with a deck of 40 cards with four coloured suits and each suit has cards numbered 1 to 9. You also get some rockets in the deck numbered 1 to 4 which function as the game's trump suit. And at the start of each mission you'll deal this entire 40 card deck to however many players you have. But you also get this smaller deck of 36 cards which mirrors the larger deck minus the rockets and if you flip over the rule book it becomes a logbook which details 50 missions you carry out sequentially on your overarching mission to discover a planet that most definitely is probably not Pluto. Now in most cases, each mission in the logbook will tell you to turn over a number of cards from the top of the smaller deck and put them in the middle of the table. From a gameplay point of view, these cards in the middle of the table are tasks you need to complete. Starting with the commander, meaning the player with the number 4 rocket, you're going to go around the table and in turn choose one of them. Now it'll vary from mission to mission, so some players might have more than others, some players might have none. Regardless, taking a task means you're making a commitment to, at some point, win the corresponding card in a trick. So if I take this pink 9, I need to win the corresponding pink 9 in a trick. And if I don't, if somebody else wins it, you fail the mission and you'll have to go back and try the whole thing again. So it turns out that this is how you make a cooperative trick-taking game. As a team, you need to work together to make sure that the right players win the right tricks at the right time. So what you might say, can't we just tell each other our cards and from this work out which cards everybody needs to play and when? Y no. No you can't. So remember when I said that the crew is like scientists and engineers using units they've just personally invented? Well, the thing which really powers this game is the fact that you're not allowed to discuss your cards. You're not allowed to show other players your cards. You're not allowed to say which numbers you have, how many of each colour card you have. Nothing that gives anybody else any information about the cards in your hand. So at the beginning of each mission, the only information you have is which cards you have in your hand, and consequently which cards are somewhere out there in other players' hands. You know which player has the number 4 rocket, and you know which cards players have chosen to try and win. And from this, and from the way everybody plays, you're going to have to infer which cards other players might have, and which cards other players might want you to play. Now there are a couple of exceptions to the no communication rule. There's a distress signal which lets everybody pass a card from their hand left or right to an adjacent player before the mission starts. And each player gets a radio communication token which lets you give the table explicit information about one of your cards. Not just which card it is, but also if it's your highest, lowest or only number of a particular colour. So this is the framework for the crew, but the logbook has a total of 50 missions. And so as the game goes on, they get more creative and more difficult, and they add new mechanics that will 
fill you with absolute dread the first time you find out about them. Uh, so some missions require that you complete tasks in a very specific order. In some missions, you might not be allowed to use any of the number nine cards to win a trick. In one particularly hellish scenario, a single player has to win every single pink card in the deck. Maybe one player around the table is not allowed to win any tricks, no matter what. So whatever happens, each mission is like its own little puzzle, but a puzzle in which you don't have all of the information and everybody's trying to solve their own little bit. So you know which cards you need to win and you know which cards other players need to win. You know which cards you have, so you'll actually spend a lot of time looking at your hand, trying to work out how to get this one particular card to the player who really needs to win it. And even if you work it out, how do you even communicate all of this information to the table? when you can't actually talk about your cards. Spoilers, a lot of the time you don't. Uh, a lot of the time you just grit your teeth and play a card and hope for the best. So here's another remarkable thing, which might weirdly be a downside for your group. In the crew, there's nearly always a solution. It's not uncommon to look at your hand and feel as if you've got an impossible task. You might feel that you've been completely screwed over by the cards, that there's no way you're going to be able to get through this mission. And then incredibly, you do. You find a way through. And this means that sometimes missions in the crew start with a sense of dread and foreboding, but actually you play three hands of cards and it's over in a couple of minutes. You won, you did it. Um, occasionally it can actually feel anticlimactic. But mostly you just feel really clever, like you just outsmarted the game. There's a tremendous sense of achievement when you all somehow manage almost telepathically to play the right cards at just the right time. Now one small but important note, the manual comes with a variant for two players, but let's be honest, the crew is meant to be played by three to five people. But Andrew, I hear you say, what if I live in some sort of hellish post-apocalyptic society in which I'm not allowed to see more than one person at a time? <laughs> You're silly. That's what the fox in the forest is for. So if you visit Foxtrot Games website, you can read the fairy tale that informs the background to the fox in the forest. It includes a queen who loves her butterflies, uh, a witch she calls on to save her butterflies from illness and who she subsequently has an argument with, causing the butterflies to turn into monsters. Also there are other monsters, maybe I couldn't really work it out. It includes a woodcutter nobody trusts because he's suspiciously well stocked with wood. Uh, a girl called Clever Helen, she's clever, and the talking fox she saves from a bear trap. There's a swan, uh, its feet are stuck in a frozen pond, but it's a swan and swans are evil, so if you want my opinion it probably did something to deserve it. Is that treason? I feel like that might be treason. Some other stuff happens with a snake and a wolf. Long story short, the butterflies come back and Clever Helen gets a silver cup. It's a fairy tale. Um, fox in the Forest is a trick-taking game. A trick taking game. What the f Now, putting aside the fairy tale, which is frankly a wild ride and I'd recommend you read it, the framework in which the fox in the forest operates is just like the crew, basic trick taking. And just like the crew, it doesn't make any sense when you think about it. How even do you make a traditional trick taking game for two people without it being a joyless and frankly pointless experience? That's foreshadowing, FYI. From the 33 cards in the deck, both players are dealt 13. You turn over the top card of the deck, which the game calls the Decree card, but mechanically it just tells you which of the three suits is the current trump suit. And then you play a trick-taking game. Literally, uh, one player leads the trick, the other player follows, the higher card wins. It shouldn't work. Um, and if the fox in the forest was just this, it wouldn't work. But the Fox in the Forest does work, and it works for a couple of very good reasons. The first is that each odd numbered card in the deck has an ability which triggers when it's played. Playing the Fox lets you swap the Decree card with a card from your hand, allowing you to change the Trump suit and or swap out a card you don't want. Uh, the Woodcutter does a similar thing, letting you draw a new card from the deck and then discarding a card from your hand. These Monarchs, the highest numbered cards in the game, force the other player to play their highest card unless they can play a one. So playing cards in the Fox in the Forest is not just a case of playing your highest card, but of playing the situationally correct card at the situationally correct time. What's the situationally correct card and what's the situationally correct time? It's situational. 
The other and probably the more important reason why the Fox in the Forest works is this, the scoring system. Now in a traditional trick taking game you'll typically get a point for each trick you win and be done with it, but the Fox in the Forest turns the concept of scoring completely on its head, awarding points depending on the number of tricks you win. If you look at the scoring chart, you'll immediately notice a couple of very interesting things. Winning no tricks in a round will actually get you the maximum six points. And since the number of tricks you win is directly related to the number of tricks your opponent wins, you'll get no points if you win too many tricks. But you can also get the maximum points if you win just enough tricks. So you can probably see what's going on here. In each round, there's a constant struggle, a push and pull as you weigh up the cards in your own hand against the cards your opponent might or is likely to have. And straight away, the cogs begin to turn as you try to work out how many tricks you think you can win. Is it worth trying to win seven to nine tricks, knowing that if your opponent's canny enough, they'll see you coming a mile away and sabotage their own game to counterintuitively sabotage your game? And if you are that opponent, what if you get it wrong? What if you misjudge your hand and you somehow accidentally win too many tricks? I should add that this is a race to 21 points, so there's not much room for error since a couple of bad rounds can put your opponent halfway to victory before you've even got going. And so most of the time rounds will end in a kind of compromise as the plan you made becomes untenable and you have to in some ways make concessions to your opponent. And this means that sometimes the fox in the forest can be decided by one round, in the way that a boxing match can be decided with a single punch. And so this might mean that it's not for you, uh, the fox in the forest, I mean not boxing. Um, so it can be disheartening when that one round goes wrong in every single way and you can feel the game slipping away from you. And once that one big round's happened, it's often just a case of game management for your opponent. But for a lot of people, and and certainly for me, this sparring quality is what makes the Fox in the Forest so good. The constant back and forth as you try to manoeuvre your opponent into position and deliver a knockout blow is... Wait, am I really comparing a fairy tale based trick taking game to boxing? In conclusion, the fox in the forest shouldn't work, uh, the crew shouldn't work, it makes no sense for either of these games to work, and yet both of them do work. Um, they're actually masterpieces of card game design, operating within a traditional framework to such a degree that they're instantly recognisable as trick taking, but at the same time they're unique and interesting and smart enough to transcend 600 years of card gaming history.